record on this computer. All right, we are live. All right, welcome to the Sunny Ray Show. Today we've got Jameson Lop, one of my favorite people, definitely in Bitcoin, maybe on the planet. So Jameson, thank you for uh, for spending some time with us. And yeah, maybe start with an intro. Yeah, good to see you again, uh, virtually at least. Virtually. Um, as for myself, I mean, uh, I've been in the space for a while, uh, started getting interested as a hobbyist, ooh, that was a good eight years ago, um, and started building some open source projects for a few years, trying to better understand Bitcoin, and then was fortunate to be able to go full time around uh, early 2015, and really since then have been focused on a very boring problem that I believe continues to persist in the space, which is just how do we make it easier for people to manage their private keys? Uh, how do we continue to push forward the fulfillment of Bitcoin's promise of being your own bank? Because it's always been possible, but it's generally been relegated to the people who are technical or who are willing to spend a lot of time and resources learning how to do it right. So if we really want to keep pushing this space forward in a decentralized fashion, then I think we continue to make it easier and easier and understand you know, where the pain points are around key management. Cool. So why, why don't we start there and, and, uh, and, and get a bit deeper on that topic? Because you're right. I, I do also believe that it's something that's incredibly important and it barely gets talked about. Um, and so, okay, so let's start with the question of like, why? Why is it important for people to hold Bitcoin? And that might, uh, it might help to maybe even proceed that question with like, you know, why is Bitcoin important? Um, but yeah, we'd love to kind of dive into that a bit more with you. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a few different approaches. You can take the more technical approach, the more philosophical approach. Um, generally, I kind of take a blended approach to all of this where, you know, what is the reason that I got into Bitcoin in the first place? And that was because I felt like money as an abstract concept should not be something that is dictated by a small group of people like money as an open source project fundamentally made sense to me. And I felt like it was humanity's best hope towards making at least a fairer type of monetary system. You know, it's probably never gonna be perfect, but at least if anyone who cares enough can give their input, then hopefully we'll get to a system that while it may not be perfect for everyone, hopefully it is at least less harmful for more people because you don't have a few people controlling it uh, at their own whim and to their own benefit. So if we assume, okay, Bitcoin has already done a pretty good job of, of doing that, of being an open project where anyone who really cares can contribute, then how do we prevent it from sliding back you know, towards what the current financial system is like? And in order to do that, we need to keep the power as decentralized as possible, as spread out as, as much as possible. We need to empower the individual. And for individuals to be empowered, they need to be able to take control of what is like the ultimate security model of Bitcoin, which is commonly referred to as trustlessness uh, and permissionlessness, though, you know, there's a whole lot of gotchas uh, underneath those words. But what I really see that as is you are you're running your own software and you're using your own hardware to uh, verify the entire state of the system and to con directly control your private keys so that you're not having to ask anyone for permission to use your money and you're not having to trust any third party that your money is actually there. And that means, you know, you need to have your own self-custody system, uh, preferably be running your own fully validating node you know, from a technical perspective. And this is where you start getting into all of the technical tricky things that can turn a lot of people off because the, the average person just wants to go to a website and click some buttons. And so now we get into this whole issue of, you know, uh, the sort of the spectrum of convenience versus security versus privacy and, and all the other trade-offs that people make. and you know, the, the freedom of a system like this is that people should be able to have 
the the freedom to choose to trade off security or privacy for convenience but at the very least i think we should try to you know lower the bar as much as possible to get into a high security posture and hopefully you know the, the lower we can make that bar the more people will opt into a a better uh security environment and the result of all of these different individuals opting into that is that we make the whole system actually stronger and more resilient because we're not putting all of the money into the hands of a few people once again. So I, 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 again, I don't want to spend like a, a whole bunch of time because we could probably spend like the whole conversation just on these two next two questions. But I think before we can make or before we can dive deep into this argument of like you, you need to hold your own private keys, we need to touch on two things. So one is, well, you know, you made this, uh, this comment that money should be open source, right? Um, and this sounds super weird, but one thing I found is, is that even though most people are like waking up early, going to sleep late at night, getting into divorces and wars and like trying to like make that, you know, cash, when you ask most people, what is money? Like, what really is it? You just like kind of stop there. <laughs> it's like crickets. And it's literally an infinite number of answers that I've received, um, which I find super interesting because it's like, what? Um, how does that even happen? But what is money? Um, you know, maybe in a paragraph or two, uh, you know, if we had to try and really distill it down to its main, main essence. Yeah, and really, I don't expect most people to understand money. I mean, I don't expect most people to understand most things. The world is such a complicated place, and we have a finite amount of time and resources. You can only focus on a few things. You know, this is why humanity has evolved the way it has to construct these hierarchical systems, because that enables specialization, and specialization allows for greater efficiency. And you know, that's how we become more productive, both individually and collectively. So what is money? I mean, money is just the way that we decide who owes who what. That's, that's the simplest way I can think of to describe it because that then can encompass any number of different systems and encompass the fact that money is whatever we collectively agree is money. And then, of course, you have the whole question of what is consensus? How do we agree upon it? What are the properties that result in humanity in general converging on certain types of systems to be money? Um, but, you know, there, there are properties that make money more appealing. And, and that is things like, um, you know, having the ability to um, have some decent idea that the value that you put in the money is going to be somewhat the same at some point in the future as it is right now. Um, there are great properties such as the ability to pay someone without having to worry about whether or not the money is going to get to where it's going. Uh, there are privacy properties of you know, the ability to send it without the entire world necessarily knowing what economic transactions are performing. But, um, you know, that's getting a lot more into the minutia um, and you, you can even get into economic arguments about whether, whether money has to have certain properties. Um, ultimately, I don't think it really matters you know, whether one specific system uh, fits all the criteria of money or not. Is, uh, money is money if people use it as such and it works for them. Very interesting, very interesting. And then, and then this notion of wealth, I mean, there's been many attempts of trying to make money digital, right? I mean, you could argue that my bank account, right, is to some extent is digital, right? I don't really actually handle cash all that much. My credit card seems to work on ones and zeros. So um, I guess like, I guess the deeper question here that I was wondering is, is like, when, when, what was your aha moment? When were you like, oh, ah, like, yes, like this can actually potentially work. Uh, like what, when was it? Like, did it take a couple times before you were like, yeah, I think there's actually something here. I'm curious to know your, your kind of, you know, deep dive story. 
Well, you know, like most people, I heard about Bitcoin a number of times and mm. dismissed it as, you know, nerd money that was going to get hacked and everybody was going to, you know, have a story that ended in tears. And so I unfortunately will never remember the first time I heard about Bitcoin because I know I heard about it several times before I actually looked into it. Mm. And, you know, it was probably the third or fourth time that it came up on Slashdot or some other news site where I actually looked into it. I actually read the white paper. And the computer science side of me was like, oh, you know, this is intriguing. Like, I, first of all, I never really thought about how money worked. And then second of all, I certainly never thought about this Byzantine generals problem before. It's just not something that was in my field of computer science of what I was you know, building with web apps uh, back in the day. And so that's what sparked my interest. And then it wasn't until I actually jumped through all the hoops of sending wire transfers and actually getting some Bitcoin and then being able to exchange it for other things of value that I realized that, you know, this is actually money. It, it actually works as such. And uh, it's a project that I think is worth you know, putting my time into. Mm. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Okay. So it's okay. So money is money is uh, Bitcoin is, and then you have this, I guess this moment in time. And before we get into the kind of the classics, I want to dig that. I want to dig deep into that. And I think there's, there's a lot of um, stuff, stuff that we need to explore, but before we do, I wanted to just ask you a couple questions. So to me, you know what, you're like a technical guy, right? So you know the word like unit step function, you know what that means, right? Like zero and then you go to like one, right? To me, when I, and I, and I was in the financial industry back in the day as well. And so when I first discovered Bitcoin, um, there was a part of me that felt like it was like this zero to one moment, you know, it was like, it brought all these like different, like philosophical and like, you know, whether it's like, you um, economical theory, game theory, you had like cryptography, you had all these like really, really interesting things coming together to solve quite possibly one of the biggest problems, um, you know, that we've ever faced. But, uh, but, you know, since then, there's been a lot of noise, right, in this space as well. And, and some could argue that it's innovation, right? Some could say, well, no, there's actually like crazy, awesome things happening there. And then you've got this, like, you've got Bitcoin, you've got like innovation question mark, and then you've got like Rujas and like the one coins of the world, right? So how does one who isn't dedicating their life to this, this world, to this craft, right? How are they to figure out what's real and what's not? Because there's a lot of projects, right, in this space. Um, so I'm just curious, like you, you seem like you have a um like a moral compass almost that you've used to kind of navigate over the last few years and i'm just curious to get a bit of pulse on that like what what kind of principles what kind of things are you looking for and and again like there's been so much innovation in the space how come jameson's not you know writing uh you know tweets and blogs and, and doing podcasts and why aren't you building your company around that um, curious. So what, what is it? So not so much about the fiat world, I get, you know, how we kind of relate to that, but like this whole everything after world, like what, yeah. what are your thoughts on it? Well, it's, it's a very simple breadth versus depth type of issue. And uh, you're certainly when Ethereum came out, I was paying attention to it. I mean, um, to my own detriment, I am certainly not good at evaluating projects as investment potential. And so I certainly try not to uh, give any sort of financial advice because I was there. I, I could have put a lot of money into Ethereum and I didn't. And you know the main reason for it was that I read the terms of the uh, Ethereum ICO. And in the terms was a section that said, you know, we are not going to promise that we're ever going to deliver any software, much less working software, much less, you know, meeting any of the grand uh, ideals that we're promising the system can do. So, uh, you know, unfortunately for me, that turned me off uh, and I should have like realized at the time that it was just, you know, legalese, you know, cover your butt type of stuff. But um, what do I do as an approach to all of this? I mean, I simply don't have the time to keep track of all of the new projects that are coming out. Um, you know, you, you could very easily turn that into a full-time job and there are plenty of people who do and then, you know, speculate based upon their own evaluation of the different projects and the different teams. Um, I would say, you know, I, I spent a decent amount of time 
looking at some of the more you know popular projects that were coming out like during the 2017 cycle and uh you know most of them were just utter trash there's there's plenty of red flags that uh, give away you know a scam project and that is usually things like uh white papers that are word salad or that are straight up you know copied from other white papers um websites that are more focused on marketing aspects and you know the team of people behind them rather than the actual technology and you know innovative functionality that they're building you know they're there's a ton of ways to evaluate uh, different projects. Um, and for me, it's just, <clears throat> I don't really think it's worth my time because the vast majority, probably 95 plus percent of them are not gonna go anywhere. And so I could spend a ton of time trying to find the diamond in the rough and maybe invest in them or try to help them or whatever. But, um, for, for me, I see Bitcoin as the one that's, you know, the greatest in the lead. It has a clear vision of what it's trying to accomplish, you know, keeping things simple, uh, trying to be the best money possible. And it's, it's a long ways from being what I would consider optimal money. So we still have a ton of work to do. And I want to continue working to fulfill that uh, singular goal. And, you know, perhaps if we get to the point that I feel like uh, we have uh, fulfilled the optimal uh, vision of Bitcoin, then perhaps I will start looking at other projects uh, in the space, but not necessarily even like the crypto finance space. My objective at a very high level when I first transitioned from just doing like data analysis for marketing company to the Bitcoin space, my, my high goal that I basically set for myself was from that point forward to use my skills and my resources to help empower individuals. And, you know, whatever I feel is going to help with that is what I'm going to work on. So Bitcoin is like the obvious, most straightforward solution to that right now. There, there are plenty of other technologies that fulfill similar um, type of objectives, but in different ways. And so that at a very high level is what I want to do. And the reason that I want to do that is because I kind of see it as uh, an issue of you know, power in the world today where I think too much power has been concentrated in the hands of too few people. And I believe that technology and my skills as, as, as a technologist give me the greatest leverage to help try to, you know, reverse some of that flow of power. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So now I'm dive a bit deeper into why, um, I was going to say one thing, so just one quick thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to think of different ways of explaining Bitcoin to people. And more recently, it kind of dawned on me that what I'm actually, I would say, defeating or beating uh, by buying Bitcoin is time, which I'd argue is maybe all of our, you know, biggest nemesis, right? Um, you know, whether you're like, whether you're thinking about what's happening in the future or some relationship you were in like years ago, whether it's like, you know, death, just having like a finite point in time, whether it's fearing old days, whatever it is, I'd say by death, I mean, generally time is what we're all fighting against. And I always found that when my mentality wrapped around fiat, there was never enough time. There was always uh, there's always me kind of like running to try and there's always more months than money as I always say it's like you know it was like just never like whether it's like taxes and inflation and you know just like the just everything just working against me um and it just felt like I was never going to get off this treadmill whereas as soon as I bought my first Satoshi in 2011 or 12 it wasn't even about like buying it and selling it it was more about like this one-way portal into timelessness and into a world where I wouldn't have to constantly look you know what I mean like feel like I was running out of time um but and I find like the decentralized not the decentralization but the the fact that it's like limited and all that it kind of lends to it but but okay so ah, sovereignty right so speak to me about key management speak to me about a little bit about I guess from a high level you know what is CASA doing right um uh, you know, in terms of like, what is the solution? And then a bit, you know, deeper into kind of what, like how you guys are actually enabling, um, you know, 
sovereignty, how you're enabling people to, you know, become owners of their own future and their own time. Yeah, I mean, money is basically time storage, right? Mm. Is, um, for a long time, I thought of money as just a way that you buy things, but it was also, you know, after getting into Bitcoin that I started thinking of it more in terms of time and that you know, the ability actually to buy other people's time is a far more interesting thing than the ability to like buy a yacht or something. Uh, so, you know, that actually, it kind of goes back to my point earlier of like leverage, um, you know, the ability of technology to leverage uh, various balances of power, or the ability of money to uh, leverage the, um, really the things that you can get done. Actually, I think I just tweeted in the past day or two about uh, leverage of code, where if you think of code as an employee, um, or I actually think of code as a sort of a manifestation of a single small tiny part of myself, is that when I write a certain script, a certain function, a certain uh, even more complex architected piece of code, what I'm really doing is I am projecting my will into the reality. I thought of something that I want to have happen and I preferably want to have happen over and over again and hopefully even want other people uh, to help have that happen. And I turn it into code, uh, I test it and, um, you know, there will be, of course, maintenance required, but once I deploy that code, it is running 24 seven with very little overhead. It doesn't require to, you know, eat or sleep or, or have, you know, health insurance or all of the other complex things that make human employees a lot more difficult to manage. It does require different types of maintenance, but in general, you get a lot more, you know, bang for your buck, especially over the long term. Now, if you're thinking about leverage, though, in terms of employees, um, you know, you can leverage other people's time by employing them for various things. Then if you combine those two, you know, and you, you, you hire employees to write the code that you want to be written, then you're really cooking with gas. You know, it's like leverage squared. I hear you. I hear you. You know, I, I, I know this, uh, this wasn't like a prepared question, but I was I'm very curious about this. Um, I don't know if you know, but I spent like 10 years in robotics. So before I got into Bitcoin, my, my wife is a mechatronics engineer. I literally helped outfit most of the major robotics labs in the world, including Stanford, Georgia Tech, IIT, MIT. Um, and I work for a company that, that essentially, you know, built products for these types of labs. And I've been thinking about um, robotics for a long time, right? So like I got to play with quadrotors, 3D printers, we have a, a, a Tesla, like we're all about like the robot renaissance. Um, but you know, lately there's been uh, a lot of talk about, have you ever heard of the, the, the term singularity, the technological singularity or whatever as they refer to oh, it? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so it's so Raymond Kurzweil, you've heard of the guy, yeah, yeah. So, you know, more, so I, I always, like, I read all those books, like, 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or whatever, right, and always found it really fascinating, kind of chucked it to the back of my mind, but then more recently, you know, you've got, like, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, and Zuckerberg, and all these, like, super um, wealthy, like, you know, technologists talking about, you know, this, this, like, similar type of idea, right, where, where it, not necessarily like these narrow bands of artificial intelligence that already exist kind of all over the world, but really kind of a, a coming together and almost like, you know, humanity giving birth to this, this, you know, something that's far, you know, that can have, you know, if, way more computations per second that has kind of the subtleness of humanity and it's able to interact with us. And, and all of that. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is I'm curious to know, number one, I guess your, your thoughts on, do you think, I mean, and, and I'm bringing this up because of what you were saying earlier, is do you, I drive a Tesla. It literally drives itself. It freaking drives itself. People don't even believe me when I tell them. It drives itself. How many people on earth drive for a living? Once two years go by and it's like, I don't even need to, like it's literally from my parking lot to the parking lot of this you know, grocery store and it drops me off and parks itself. I mean, once it's at that level, it's gonna almost like overnight disrupt like a lot of people's jobs, especially people who drive for a living. Are we gonna tell those people's 
those people to become programmers. And by the way, I don't know if you've seen open AI and what they're doing with like, you would be able to convert natural language into code, like, oh my freaking God. So even telling someone to become a programmer might not be a long-term sustainable solution. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to that day, right? Is that right now, you know, we have a wide variety of programming language languages to choose from. And there have been great advancements in programming languages over the past few decades, but it is still a huge pain to turn that concept into reality, especially in a way that is robust and doesn't break uh, around edge cases. And so, yeah, I, I really look forward to the day where we have the Star Trek type of thing of like computer, create a program that simulates, you know, these conditions. And then, you know, a few minutes later, you have everything you could ever imagine. So that, that will certainly be great. But, you know, even then, you're going to have to have some sort of meta scientist, you know, who is building those systems uh, until, you know, perhaps we get to that singularity point. But, you know, there are, uh, there are a lot of scary things, of course, that can happen as a result of all of this, uh, you know, kind of to your point about Tesla, um, I don't have a Tesla because I don't trust all the data collection that it's doing. Like, I don't know what it's doing with all of that information. I know why it needs a lot of it, but uh, I also know that, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of information are getting sent back to Tesla headquarters and getting warehoused in a central repository. And while yes, it's being used to make the system better, uh, that data, uh, I consider all data about me to be a toxic waste of sorts. And so uh, there's the question of, you know, is that risk that I'm taking worth the trade off of having a car that comes when I calls or a car that uh, will, you know, drive down the highway and probably do a better job at it than I would myself. Um, and, you know, these same type of issues come up with basically anything. Um, and especially as we approach the singularity, uh, the world is just going to continue to become a weirder and weirder place. And, you know, it is, I mean, I think we're already in a type of uh, early cyberpunk dystopia. There's a lot of dystopian things about the world in 2020, uh, much less when we start looking forward a few decades, it's going to get even crazier. So uh, we have to try to protect ourselves as much as possible and, you know, understand uh, as many of the potential ramifications as possible, but there's also just, there's so many unforeseeable consequences that I actually believe that, you know, we're in one of those periods right now in a civilization where everything is evolving so quickly that it's actually one of the most dangerous points in time for our civilization to uh, you know, go over the brink and self-destruct. Uh, you know, there are a, a number of different things that could go wrong and essentially cause a collapse of everything that we have built. Yeah, man. I'm not trying to be a downer. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I, and I'll cut, stop harping on this topic here, but just curious, as a technologist, and this is like more of like a thought experiment, something that I've been thinking about is, is like, do you think, so like, you know that mad scientist you talked about? I'm super scared of that guy. Because like, that's yeah. exactly what we don't want, right? <laughs> like one dude designing like some sort of AI software. So I was curious, do you think that Bitcoin could be, could serve as like the nervous system for some sort of like future artificial intelligence? Like could it, because you know, I've read a lot of books on AI and then there's a couple of like major concerns that they have. One is just the fact that it computes at a very, like very fast rate right? and humans can't even like comprehend how it's coming to its decision. Like it just does it. Um, so we might need to have checks and balances. I, I, I sometimes wonder if it's like humanity's role to try and figure out some way to like give us, you know, the, the leash on this day, right? Um, and I don't know, like, are there, like you, you hear about Neuralink, it's like, well, you can't beat them, join them. But <laughs> like, is there a way to, again, to, I, I don't know, I don't know. It doesn't, but I, have, you, have you thought much about AI? Have you kind of looked into this space? Like, have you seen the open AI, the GPT-3 project and some of the things? It, was it yeah. Mar, 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 Marzin or Mar, Maros or whatever that wrote that? Did you read that article? Like, uh, it's one of the some Bitcoin guy out of Argentina wrote a yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, he posted things on Bitcoin talk on, and, and then you read the whole article. At the end of the article, he's like, "By the way, this article wasn't written by me. It was written by <laughs> yep. OpenAI." That was a bit scary for me, um, and so yeah. So, so I, I do, I do, you know, and I know what kind of, like what doctors even do. Like, I mean, 
I think there could be a time in the near future where a nurse is potentially more valued than a doctor because like I, I can imagine computers making decisions uh, like doctors mm -hmm. do far more you know better than like a person that needs to relate oh, to yeah. a human being. Yeah, you know I mean, what I mean? It's, it's, it's kind of insane like the amount of sort of data knowledge and retrieval that is expected of a doctor um, you know that's not possible for like the human mind to know all of medical science at this point like it's just too much. Mm. Even if you're a specialist in one tiny part of the medical field, you probably still don't uh, know everything. Or you know, once again, it's like Bitcoin and the crypto space is that even if I'm a Bitcoin expert, it's just it's physically impossible for me to keep up with all of the things happening in the space. So it makes sense to use some sort of AI, you know, knowledge retrieval system because it will be able to pick up things, you know, the instant that they hit the internet, basically, and you know merge that into the collective consciousness, if, if you will, uh, from a like adversarial AI taking over the whole world perspective, you know, I don't think that uh, one of those AIs would like run on a like decentralized uh, consensus network simply because they're so computationally slow. Yeah. However, what we have seen, um, even just I think in the past year, uh, novel new uses of even the Bitcoin blockchain as a censorship resistant uh, pointer to information. And specifically, I'm referring to there have been uh, botnets that have used the Bitcoin blockchain as a command and control uh, database because these, uh, these bots uh, can essentially, you can have your bots infect a million different machines. And inevitably, in, in the sort of botnet space, what happens is uh, the botnet has some sort of centralized command and control infrastructure. It's usually it's using like a domain or an IP address or something else where all of the, the worker infected machines will go out and ask for instructions of what should I do now that I've taken over this machine. And so when re security researchers and you know, government officials and whatever are looking to take down these botnet uh, networks, they go for the head. They just, they want to chop off the head and basically all those infected machines, they'll still be infected, but they won't do anything because they can't get any instructions. So the novel thing that has just started to happen recently is these botnet operators realize that they can spend a very tiny amount of Bitcoin and actually put instructions you know, in the Bitcoin blockchain with the op return functionality that does nothing but, you know, a uh, link to uh, some website or IP address, uh, you know, somewhere else on the internet. It could, you know, potentially could even be something like IPFS, you know, some other distributed data store to basically say, all right, you know, go here and get your updated instructions. And there is, as you know, no one in the world who has the authority or the ability to stop Bitcoin transactions from going into the blockchain. Therefore, you now have botnets that are essentially a hydra of you can, you know, you can cut off the most recent uh, infrastructure that is, is hosting the commands but all the botnet operator has to do is create another Bitcoin transaction with the right data format, put it in the blockchain and say, all right, your new instructions are now located at this other, you know, completely different part of the internet, some server hosted somewhere else. And, you know, it, it just, it turns it into a Hydra where no one can, uh, can permanently stop it. And, you know, I, I, this is a bit, maybe a bit controversial, but I always felt that, like, in the future, in future, I mean, like, 10, maybe 20 years out, I think that bots, I think robots will be, um, like, they'll, they'll dwarf human, humans in terms of, like, uh, you know, their usage. Like, when I think of, and I agree with you on the, the concerns around Tesla, I, I think about that stuff, too. Um, but, but when I picture my automated car in the future, passing yours right because that's what's going to happen right i'm going to pass yours but the way it's going to happen is your car is going to uh send some sort of message saying i've got nothing on my calendar for the next two hours i've got whereas my calendar knows i've got you know a meeting that i'm late for and they're just going to not do like a wire transfer between one another they're going to like just send something that feels and looks like tcp ip 
um, and then your car's gonna move. By the way, I'm gonna zip past you. But I, I, I can't, and I, whether it's my washing machine talking to my TV, telling it to come on three hours later because it's on. I mean, I just, I can see there being like an economy between machines and, and Bitcoin strikes me as something that, um, you know, would make that possible. Okay. Um, Casa. So I want to talk about this. So it, I'm going to try and first explain what I understand uh, Casa to be in just my layman's terms. So there's there's like these exchanges, right? There's websites that people can buy uh, Bitcoin, right? But once you buy it, you don't actually hold your Bitcoin sitting on some server um, that's controlled by, you know, whoever, right? Um, and so for the longest time, Bitcoiners have known that, you know, the, the best thing to do is to, to not have your Bitcoin uh, on exchanges, right? The best thing to do is for you to hold your own Bitcoin. And then, you know, uh, whether it's Trezor or, um, you know, Open Dime and, you know, I love the, the, the Open Dime guys. There's um, all these like kind of, you know, wallets, hardware wallets, if you will, that look like USB sticks and you can essentially hold your, your crypto there. They don't connect to the internet and you're safe-ish. Okay, so I guess to me, Casa strikes me as like the next kind of evolution, right? It's like, well, yeah, great, you've done that. You've got the treasure, whatever, in your box at home. But what if a bad guy comes with a gun and says, you know, says, hey, well, give me that treasure. Now all the security in the world and all the math isn't going to work for you because you've got a gun to your head. So in that case, you're going to want to use something like multi-sig or you're going to, and I don't even know, this is part of my question is, is like, is it multi-sig? Is it Shamir's? Like, you know, like how, how are you guys actually making this happen? But the idea effectively is, is that I would have, you know, maybe M of N, maybe three of five keys or two of three keys that I'd need to reconstruct to be able to access my Bitcoin. Maybe one is in India, one is in Canada, one is buried somewhere in the middle of the ocean or something or a field. And, um, and so I could essentially recreate my keys, but anybody who comes to my house, I essentially can't because I, I don't have all the keys. I need to recreate it. So is that essentially the problem statement that you're trying to solve for, or am I missing something? Yeah. I mean, Casa is the system that I wanted for myself. Um, the sort of background history is, you know, I started working for BitGo in early 2015, was basically running Bitcoin infrastructure for them. They're doing enterprise multi-sig, basically helping exchanges and other uh, service providers help to secure their hot wallets because, you know, they need to be constantly transacting. They need to be keeping keys online. That's the most dangerous thing that you can do, but it's a business requirement for a lot of enterprises. So you need a lot of extra security and sort of processes around managing uh, those hot wallets. So, you know, the way that they improved upon just having a single key on a single machine is they split up the keys. They did two of three a multi-sig solution where you need to get signatures from multiple different machines that are secured by completely different type of firewalls and software and uh, human processes, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, you know, making it exponentially more difficult for an attacker because they now have to break into multiple different completely, you know, uh, separate setup systems, you know, they have to find ways to exploit not only one system, but multiple systems. And, you know, this, this was good. It was certainly an improvement, but it was far from perfect. You know, we still had a few incidents over the years where usually what would happen is someone would infiltrate the internal infrastructure of a client and, and basically spoof them and, and make, you know, API calls that look legitimate and follow the rules and whatever. And so it was still possible for someone to get into the system and steal money. And so what I realized after working there for several years is that I was spending one to two days every year refreshing my own cold storage setup. And this was an extremely onerous thing for me to do. Um, I have an article that I wrote about it a few years ago, which it was like, like a 15 or 20 step process that would take, uh, you know, a day or two. And what I was basically doing is, you know, gathering all my different wallet data and seed phrases and stuff and using an air gapped computer to create an encrypted uh, file system that I would then put onto different uh, data storage drives. And I would, um, I would then Shamir secret share the decryption key. And then, you know, I would spread out copies of 
these encrypted data drives and, and give one piece of the uh, Shamir sharing to each of my uh, executors, if you will. So I wanted not only a cold storage system that was secure against attackers, I wanted something where if I get hit by a truck, my heirs would be able to reconstitute those keys and actually spend the money. That's actually one of the harder parts to everything is like, it's easy to secure your keys. Uh, if you wanna be you know, completely silly about it, uh, you know, you can basically destroy your keys and they're, that's as secure as they'll ever get. No one will ever be able to access them, including yourself. Uh, what gets a little bit harder is if you want to secure your keys against uh, everybody in the world except for yourself, well, then you just need to create a much more diverse and robust uh, set of security that makes it almost impossible for anyone who is not specifically you to get through all the different layers of security. But then, what if you want to build a system where you can access your keys, but if you're dead, a few certain other people also are able to access them? That just like explodes the complexity even more and uh, is actually something that we've uh, started offering at CASA. But to kind of step back a bit to like, what did we actually so do? Can you just building? stop for one second? Are those yeah. people, sorry, when you just said that, like they can access it if I die. But doesn't mm -hmm. that also mean they can access it if I don't die? <laughs> well, so we just stop that. that? <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that is why the, uh, the difficulty in setting up a system like that is so tricky. Um, and, that's, and that's because, you know, it's the Oracle problem, right? It's the same problem that, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of these other uh, things have issues with when you want to do something on the blockchain that is reliant upon an event that happened outside of the Bitcoin network or whatever other crypto network you're, you're, you're running on. And uh, yeah, so just to jump back in. Um, yeah, so I was gonna say, so you were talking about, you know, lawyers and my estate getting access to my funds and all that. But I mean, like, I, I think about that stuff quite a bit, right? But I, I don't think, I think most people, they just care about themselves. So I, I was just curious, um, how does somebody, you know, use your solution or your system to protect their own Bitcoin so that they can be super loaded one day when they're old or whatever, if they think Bitcoin's gonna go to the moon? Just curious. So, and from what I understood, it's that, uh, one thing I liked about it is that if I have to rely blindly on Trezor, uh, you know, if something goes wrong with Trezor, which we've seen in the past, you know, not Trezor specifically, but you know what I mean, these wallets, like you hear, oh, there's a vulnerability, that scares me a bit. So um, if I want to maximize my chances, if I use something like Casa, I could, you know, use Trezor, use a, uh, you know, another, you know, brand company's wallet, I could use maybe my thinking, I think even my, my phone as like one of the, you know, keys. So can you just talk a little bit about that? I mean, th that seems to me like a super like intelligent way of, you know, securing your own Bitcoins for you. Yeah, yeah. we, we kind of jumped forward to the highest tier, most extreme offering that we have with the inheritance setup. Mm. Like that is that is a pretty in-depth setup that requires a lot of handholding. And, you know, we charge a lot of money for it because mm. of all the, the time, the, the hours that go into it. But, um, we, you know, we have a couple of other tiers, you know, a very entry level tier uh, at only $10 a month where all you need is one or two hardware devices and you can set up a two out of three SIG. Uh, essentially just plugging in your ledger or your Trezor or your cold card. Uh, and you know, we, we plan on continuing to add more as, as we continue to test other hardware manufacturers. But the idea around this at a very high level is to eliminate single points of failure. And so, while a hardware device on its own is great, it's far superior to keeping your coins on an exchange. It's far superior to keeping your coins in a like single signature hot wallet on a mobile phone or a computer or whatever. Uh, you, you're essentially taking those keys offline. You're, you're creating an air gap so that hackers can't steal them. There's still a ton of ways that you can lose that money. Uh, probably, I would say, more ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot and just lose access to it rather than having it actually stolen from you. But there are still plenty of other attack vectors where you could be tricked into sending it um, that you know, we've seen plenty of people lose money to uh, essentially uh, 
sophisticated types of phishing now where we have we've improved the technical security of the keys by putting them on dedicated hardware so now the attackers are essentially going after what is the weakest link which is the humans you know the brains where they're hacking people's brains to trick them into sending their money to uh, the attackers so uh, when we want to eliminate single points of failure it basically means we want to understand that humans make mistakes and we can't build brittle systems that can have a catastrophic failure where you lose all your money because you made one stupid mistake or you got tricked by one stupid piece of malware, et cetera, et cetera. So by taking keys, putting them on dedicated hardware devices, and then distributing them geographically, we save you from all types of not only attack vectors, but also just loss vectors of things that could go wrong that could you know, cause those keys to get uh, destroyed for some reason. And then the, the, like, the ultimate backup to all of this is that CASA holds a key offline where if you lose keys yourself, then you can go through an authentication process with us to get us to essentially co-sign a transaction and we can then help you restore your key set. So one of the, the major differences between us and a lot of other multi-sig uh, providers is that we actually have like flexibility and key rotation built into the app itself. So, you know, if, your treasure uh, goes missing, is stolen, destroyed, whatever. Managing seed phrase for that offline somewhere because that turns into a whole complex issue of physical security for uh, the, the data that is essentially your private keys because you're no longer keeping it on a, a special dedicated device. Instead, what we enable you to do in the app is essentially go buy a new hardware device off the shelf, plug it in, and then we walk you through a uh, what is really a wallet sweep transaction to rotate out that old key and move your funds to this new set of keys. It's just a, it's a more flexible way of thinking about multi-sig. Okay, wait, I, I don't think I fully understood that. So did you just say that even if I lose all my treasure and my all my keys, I can come to you guys and there's a process by which I can still retrieve my Bitcoin. And if that's the case, how do I protect against, you know, mad scientist, AKA Jameson running away from my funds? Oh uh, yeah. So it's not, it's not all of them, right? So the ultimate, mm. the trade, the, the trade off to self custody is that there will always be a path through which you can lose your money. The way that CASA designs our system is to basically build guide rails into the app to try to steer people down the road of best practices so that you know, we're not assuming that people are reading manuals and spending hours, days, weeks learning about them. Rather, if they just follow what the app tells them to do, they should be in a better situation than 99.9% .9 of other Bitcoiners. So if you're in a two out of three setup, for example, um, you can either have one mobile key, one hardware device, and then the CASA key, or you can do two different hardware devices in the CASA key. There's trade-offs there around you know, security and trustworthiness. Like some people may not like the idea of having a mobile key. We actually think that the, the trade-offs with the mobile key are great because we can actually, uh, back it up in a secure fashion. And uh, we have a blog post about this as well, where the, the key itself is kept encrypted on the device, uh, but then we further create a different encrypted backup of that key that we put in your cloud storage, uh, Apple storage or Google storage, whatever that may be, depending on your device. And the decryption key for that is not stored on your phone. It's not stored in the cloud. It's actually stored on Casa's server, also additionally encrypted with one of our hardware security modules, essentially creating like a two of two uh, type of backup. You know, it kind of like Shamir sharing, but without all the complexity behind Shamir sharing. Um, 
the cool thing about that is that, you know, if you lose your phone, if you upgrade your phone, whatever, then all you have to do is log back into your Casa account and the same Apple or Google account. And it can suck down both of those pieces of data and reconstitute that mobile key all behind the scenes. So automated backups, especially secure automated backups, we're a big fan of. What we're not a big fan of is people writing down their seed phrase on a piece of paper and trying to figure out how to physically secure it. Hey, James. Okay, so just to be clear about one thing, um, Casa is obviously a website. Um, I, I, from my understanding, I know Casa, you guys used to sell a node at one point, which was like a hardware device. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a physical hardware device as well, right? That I plug my treasures into or am I missing something here? So Casa Can itself, yeah. Does, uh, yeah, we don't actually manufacture any hardware. Um, mm. you know, we had the, we had the node, but that was all off the shelf, you know, Raspberry Pi type stuff. Like we've never been a hardware manufacturer, nor do we want to be. The, the idea uh, behind getting rid of single points of failure is to actually create a diversity of different uh, security for each key. So like I said, every multi-sig setup, whether it's two or three or three or five, will have one key with CASA. And you know, we control those keys completely offline. They're never on, on any online uh, storage. I mean, if, if they're needed to be used, then they get loaded onto a dedicated air-gapped hardware device. Um, then you have uh, the mobile key, which is, like I said, it's either on your iOS or Android phone. It is secured by the secure element that is, you know, in that phone itself to encrypt it and use the various authentication mechanisms that that operating system provides. You know, it could be biometrics, it could be a PIN, et cetera. It's whatever you have uh, configured on your phone for security. And then you have either one hardware device uh, or, or two hardware devices uh, for two of three, or for the three of five, you have three different hardware devices. And the whole idea around that is, once again, it's a completely separate type of like computer storage system. And also, if you have multiple hardware devices, then you should use different manufacturers. So, you know, you shouldn't have all treasures or all ledgers or all cold cards because, you know, there could be some supply chain issue. Uh, you know, there could be a bug, uh, you know, any number of things. And you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and that's also why Casa itself uh, is not interested in manufacturing a hardware security device because that would that would put more trust in Casa, and we want to have less trust in Casa. Interesting, interesting. And by the way, like I said, I spent I spent ten years in, in robotics, so I came to the conclusion that they call hardware hardware because it's hard. <laughs> it's also like it's very cumbersome. So I'm curious. Oh, so interesting. So the node was uh, just like a bit of a side project. It wasn't really anything that you guys doubled down on. Um, and, and so yeah, by the way, was, I have all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the, the node was a funny thing because it, uh, from a like sheer uh, marketing and branding perspective, it surpassed <laughs> our, it, it surpassed <laughs> our like uh, security service as a like known thing. And so due to the popularity of the node, that was what we became known for, even though uh, we had been doing the multi-sig security service for over a year before we launched the node. And so now we're, we're kind of having to readjust and like reacquaint people with the fact that, you know, we're fundamentally a key management service for people to, you know, self-custody their own funds. And, uh, the node was a very, very different type of thing. It, it was never a high security thing. It had a lot of things that could go wrong with it. And you know, we always told people from the offset, it was even in the, the, the set, one of the setup screens that said, don't put more money on this than you're willing to lose because this is a highly experimental project. <laughs> Funny how the internet works, right? It just kind of runs away with things. Um, okay, but just just to kind of clarify, just to finish up on this though, is it that, so if you're someone listening to this and you want to partake in this like, you know, super high security, you know, network or system or whatever, you, you, all you need is you need a, 
a legit cell phone so you can download the Casa app. You need, um, you know, ideally a couple of like maybe a Trezor, uh, no, whatever, a, a cold card and I want a ledger maybe, right? So I've got all those at home. So you're saying I can essentially, I, I need to, I can get set up. I, I don't know why I thought in my head that there was also another hardware that like acted as like the, the piece that brought all the different hardwares together, um, but it doesn't. Okay, good. Okay, so anything else on the before we kind of move over to these last few questions? Um, just curious, like any other things you want to you want to maybe mention on the anything you want to clear up in terms of confusion or just maybe share anything? I don't know. Usually, people don't like talking about future things, but I don't know. Is there a product that's coming out? I guess you said you you are you do have a blog or something coming out on the weekend, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm constantly talking about. Uh new topics that I, yeah, I think yeah. have not received enough attention. Um, you know, the one thing that we didn't touch on at all with CASA, because we were mainly talking about the technical aspects of it, the unique major difference I would say between CASA and any other self-custody setup, because of course you can, you know, we're not recreating the will. You there, There's any number of other software that you can go out and create your own multi-sig setup for. Uh, one of the main reasons that I would recommend CASA is because we have a service component that you're just not going to find with a do-it-yourself solution. And that's one of the other major differences with the different tiers is that when you go up into the higher tiers, it really turns into more of a bespoke like private client services type of arrangement where you, know, you have a dedicated uh, client advisor that you know, if you have any issues, questions, you run into anything, you can actually get on a phone call with somebody, which is almost unheard of in the Bitcoin space. Uh, you know, with, with a lot of a lot of providers out there. Um, you know, if you're using like an open source project, then that's all community driven stuff. Like you might post on a forum and hope that somebody cares enough to respond to you. If you're using some sort of like custodial service, like an exchange or whatever, then you're probably going to uh, send them an email and hope that they respond. You know, during bull markets, you might not get a response for over a month. Uh, and really with us, it's like if you're if you're paying us at a premium tier, then we're going to dedicate actual human bandwidth where if you want to get on a phone call or video call or whatever, then you know, you'll have dedicated customer support. So it's um, one of the ways we actually describe that is like uh, at Casa, we're not here to hold your keys. We're here to hold your hand. So hmm. we're, we're here to help people. It's, it's a great option for non-technical people or people who are new to the space and don't have the time uh, to you know, spend figuring out all of the, the minutia around best practices. Makes sense. Makes sense. Hey, James, I have a question. So as somebody who's, you know, spent what, almost eight years in the exchange brokered space, um, have you have you figured out a way where let's say users of let's say Unocoin can hold their funds or Bitcoin at like you know I know it sounds almost like an impossible thing but maybe not um, where I can hold my Bitcoin you know in my possession in in kind of a Casa environment but then have those Bitcoin in some shape or form show up on an exchange that makes it tradable um, I mean I can kind of think of maybe a couple ways but just curious to know is that something you guys have thought about or, or come come across? Well, we've certainly thought about it and we've even talked to uh, some other companies about, you know, this type of, well, it, what, it would essentially require two things. Uh, it would require a like hybrid custody solution where um, you have like one key held by the exchange, one key held by CASA, one key held by the user. If you can, you know, think, Think of how that would would uh, essentially put you into a setup. That's where, pretty sick. Okay, I just got that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. So you know, um, but that that's only the technical part. The the, the thing that's kind of like Bingo, isn't it? Sorry, I don't not to yeah, the waters, but it's uh, a bit like that, or not really. Yeah, and so um, you may remember Bitgo had a service called Bitgo Instant. And the way that BitGo Instant worked is that you'd have one key at BitGo, one key at uh, your service, and then the third key was with a third uh, party like key recovery service. And so that's just the technical components. What is required though to make that work from an enterprise like organizational level is it requires legal agreements between uh, the two companies that essentially say, you know, if 
if the user defaults or if the user meets these other situations, then you, other company, are legally obligated to sign the transaction that sends the money away from the user and uh, into my account. And so it is certainly doable. Uh, the tricky thing that comes into play is that uh, usually with exchanges, there's a uh, a very like limited time window to actually execute these things and get them done is like when the markets are moving, people need to liquidate really quickly. And so you would also need to have some sort of service level agreement in there that says, you know, not only will I you know, co-sign a transaction to send the money to you under these certain circumstances, but I will do it within, you know, this many hours or this many blocks. Uh, because uh, usually what, what's the reason why something like that would be happening would be that you got margin called or, you know, you, you hit some other liquidation trigger that required the money to be sent out of your account and to the exchange and then perhaps to somebody else who was then owed that money. So it gets a little more complicated. And, you know, once again, it, it's, uh, it's going to involve like humans in the legal system. So it starts to become more fragile. <laughs> well said. Okay. 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 So I had a couple questions, Jameson, that I wanted to ask you. So and we touched on maybe pieces that are here and there, but okay. First question is, you know, what is, what is like one, you know, truth that you believe that you think most, you know, and we can go one of two ways, either Bitcoin or crypto, uh, maybe crypto might be the, or, you know, blockchain or you're going to call it that most blockchainers would disagree with you on. So what's one truth that you know to be true than most, you know, blockchainers, I hate that word, but we would disagree with you on. I still think, and I think I've been saying this for at least five years, but I still think that it is important that we actually come to some sort of consensus around how much it should actually cost for people to be able to transact on chain. And the reason for that is that um, the, the sort of second order effect of that is that if it's too costly to transact on chain, then it will be too costly for people to move their funds off of trusted third parties and into self-custody. Um, you know, this is a very complicated issue because uh, there, it, it, you know, butts up against issues of how much does it cost to fully validate the whole system and run a full node and whatnot. And so you, you can't, you can't let it be zero cost because then the blockchain data will blow up and it becomes too expensive to validate. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if it costs hundreds of dollars to, you know, withdraw your money to your own wallet, then that's going to prevent a lot of people from doing that. And, you know, maybe second layer solutions will be able to get us there, but I think it's fundamentally impossible for a second layer solution to ever be as secure as a base layer solution. So at least like as it stands right now, I don't see, I don't foresee people, you know, holding their life savings in a second layer solution. Okay, fair enough. Cool. Cool, I, I got that. Um, and then, and then the same question as it pertains to like the world at large. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of weirdness going on in the world right now. But just wanted to know if you had any, you know, again, strong beliefs where you kind of saw the light or see the light, and and most you know people in the world would probably disagree with you on. Um, I mean. In general, I still believe that uh, the like crypto anarchy line of thinking, the sovereign individual thesis and that line of thinking for the general trajectory of the world uh, will prove to be true, though I also don't necessarily think that that is in conflict with a number of other things, uh, especially with, you know, Orwellian nightmare dystopias where it could very well end up being the case that the vast majority of the populace is not free and you know is living in a, a dystopian surveillance state which we kind of already are uh, whereas the you know the financial and technical elite are able to retreat to their citadels as it were and uh, you know, be true sovereign individuals that are you know wielding a power that is perhaps on on a level similar to, if not eventually exceeding that of nation states. And this is crazy for people to 
imagine, but like historically it has happened before. Like there have been plenty of times in history where private individuals wielded power that was, you know, even like militarily greater than nation states, for example. Um, It's just not something that we've seen in the past few centuries. (laughs) Very interesting. Okay, so James, I I know I've uh, used up like almost my hour and a half with you. Anything else that you want to talk about, what you want to ask me, you want to, I don't know, share about uh, just recent events? I didn't really touch on all this like DeFi, you know, stuff that's going on and all that. I mean, it doesn't sound like you're, you're too into it. I, I did see a little bit of uproar about, uh, and again, I don't know if you want to touch on it or not, but something about some sort of security token offering recently. I'm just curious to know your, I was curious to know your thoughts on, on whether or not you think that you know, I'm, 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 I'm not going to lie. I, I, I wrestle with, with the idea of Ethereum a lot in my head because I think what we were talking about earlier in this call, um, it didn't feel right at the beginning, but I have a hard time justifying that, that it doesn't have some value to the world in the sense that it is, you know, it does pull in a lot of people into the crypto community and a lot of those people end up in Bitcoin. Okay, so is that such a terrible thing? You know, the Turing completeness, right? As an engineer, that's something that I understand. I get that Bitcoin can do it too. And that most likely it was left out because of the attack vector that it presents. And therefore it never presented something super sexy for me. It's like, okay, well we can do, you know, while loops and if then, um, but like the question is, do you want to do that for money? But yep. they're not trying to design or optimize around money. And I recently had a, a bit of back and forth with Vitalik's dad on Twitter as well, where, <laughs> you know, he was pretty much, it was actually in relation to Samson and, and Vitalik doing an interview where, long story short, you know, Vitalik pretty much admitted that one of the biggest challenges that Ethereum faces is that it doesn't stand for anything. And, uh, and, you know, I don't know, maybe that's like a good thing in some way, but I, I struggle to find how that's a good thing in the sense that like, you know, maybe like it's kind of like a Swiss army knife. It doesn't really stand for something, but, you know, a Swiss army knife yeah. does stand for something. It stands for the ability to do lots of things. You know, I prefer it uh, kitchen sink <laughs> protocol. Kitchen sink. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I, I don't know. I guess my, my my kind of quick question on that front is: Do you think DeFi is like a a reemergence of like the ICO kind of you know wave, or 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 like you know DEXs? Like as someone who believes in decentralization, as someone who's like spent his you know last eight years in centralized exchanges, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't you know dream about someday you know our service being obsolete because because you can do it like all on the chain and so when i do see you know glimpses of that when i see protocols like attempting to solve real problems not the bitcoin problem which is money at large but problems i i I just i can't it's hard for me to be like well these guys are all scammers and they're like the rujas like but but they're they're trying to do something that's like Mm -hmm. legit so i guess i'll just leave it at that like what are your thoughts like how does one you know reconcile like innovation with scamminess (laughs) well so (laughs) ethereum you know has every right to exist and it is you know going back to sort of the uh, crypto anarchy thinking you know no one can stop anyone from performing these experiments. Um, obviously, people get pissed off when they think that you know, someone is pushing the line a little too far and like promising too much uh, when it comes to like what what could my experiment potentially be able to offer the world someday. Um, this is, you know, it's almost like a Theranos type of thing where. Uh, if you saw any of the documentaries around that uh, with like Elizabeth Holmes, um, I got the impression that, you know, Elizabeth may have deluded herself into believing that, you know, they could deliver on all of the promises that she, she was making. And from my own experience with a lot of CEOs, you know, founders essentially of, of startups, you have to have a certain level of delusion that what you're doing is possible because 
if everyone believed that what you were doing was possible, then someone else would have already done it. It's, it's almost a requirement in order to go out and do innovative things is you have to have not only the belief that it is possible, but you have to have the uh, persuasiveness to convince at least some other people that it's possible so that you can you know, collectively get your resources together to try to make it happen. Um, and you know, that's where it starts to get tricky of you know, making promises or making um, grandiose statements about what you're gonna be able to do, which then may result in people committing resources uh, that they end up losing. I mean, this is, this is all just part of the game of trying to build new things. So, you know, Ethereum uh, deserves its chance. Like no, no one's gonna be able to stop it or shut it down. I think the ultimate question will be, um, you know, will it be able to achieve more of the vision of what the people are working on it are trying to do or will it kind of like collapse under its own weight and will you know there end up being more uh, ethereum competitors that kind of uh, take off different pieces of the functionality that is being built on ethereum as a generalized machine um, and you know, perhaps we have other networks that kind of spawn off and are more specialized and able to do those things better. Uh, it's really hard to say at this point, but just from a computer science standpoint, it seems to me like Ethereum is uh, on a roadmap to become more complicated and not less complicated. And so that's the main reason why it's difficult for me to believe that they're going to be able to you know, hit all of the, the scaling uh, desires that they want to do. Um, but, you know, you can make similar arguments about Bitcoin and, and second layer scaling. I mean, that's a lot more complicated than uh, base layer stuff, you know, as I've had a lot of hands-on experience uh, with doing lightning node stuff at Casa, for example. So um, that's why it's hard for me to distinguish between what I would consider to be a... Um, conscientious malevolent scammer and a person who is perhaps overly optimistic and essentially scamming themselves into believing that a certain thing is possible because you know they might end up being proven right well, so i yeah i've only i've only called out probably fewer than like 10 what i consider to be conscientious scammers in the space who obviously knew that what they were promising could never be possible. Um, most of the other folks in the space, I try to give the benefit of the doubt and just look at it as, you know, they're trying to achieve what is currently impossible and they may fail, um, but uh, you gotta let them try. Okay, so Jason, I, before I let you go, I gotta ask you one more thing. So because you brought this up, I'll just say these two words and let you kind of go, Craig Wright. Um, well, maybe there's more than two minutes worth to talk about there, but how are you so positive um, that he's not who he claims to be? Well, did you read my 20 page article that I published? <laughs> I did. So if you had to TLDR yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason that I'm so positive, I mean, the TLDR is that he promised multiple times to provide the very simple, straightforward cryptographic evidence that he's, that would prove that he was Satoshi like that. If he was Satoshi, it would be very easy to do. And mm. instead what we have is an entirely insanely complex web of, of lies and half truths and distortions. And of course there is some truth sprinkled in there to make it seem like it could all be real. Um, but it's just, it's like the hallmarks of a confidence man in that what he does is he says a lot of things that inspire confidence in, in him or make him seem to be uh, far more intellectual than he actually is. Like he tries to act like he's speaking over everyone or speaking at a level uh, at which no one else is able to understand him. But the true mark of being an intellectual is that you're able to distill complex things into simple matters that you can then explain and educate to people who aren't at your level. And I've never seen him do anything like that it is always the inverse. Mm. And, you know, it, instead, you know, creating a, a complexity instead of, you know, shedding complexity to help people understand. So um, it, 
it it all has the the hallmarks of a ruse or an affinity scam. Um, you know, it's obviously it's hard to tell, you know, what his actual incentives are. Um, but there's certainly like how did he treat stuff. Gavin? <laughs> how did he treat Gavin? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I believe from what Gavin told us, like there was, there was a, a, like a fresh laptop that got introduced that was like, um, it was brought in by, I think one of Craig Wright's assistants. So, you know, that could have been tampered with. Um, I'm pretty sure he was running some other software that I don't believe he, he ran integrity checks on to make sure that that hadn't been tampered with in general, like the whole the whole key like proof process that Gavin was subjected to. We don't really know the parameters of that. It was not a controlled environment. Therefore, there's a ton of different things that could have been tampered with. And, you know, that in and of itself, like doing a private key proof session is a red flag in and of itself because the whole point of public private key cryptography is that you can sign a message that you can then show to the entire world and not be worried about any security ramifications. True, 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 true. Um, by the way, I, 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 yeah. So, okay, just a couple of things on this point. So the fact that he said he was going to prove it and never ended up doing it um, does not prove that he's Satoshi, but also does not disqualify that point. And then also his his uh, inability to speak at like, you know, at a very simple pace also I, I feel doesn't necessarily disqualify him, right? In the sense that it, it's probably a signal in the opposite direction, but is it, uh, I mean, by the way, we're at the end of our hour and a half. So I guess what I was, uh, you know, I was trying to get at is, is that, you know, and, and, and then and could he have other reasons as to why he doesn't want to publicly disclose, i.e. like the tax man or something? I mean, there's always, you know, I've heard about the Australia situation and all that. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely don't believe his Satoshi. I just, I just, uh, I just, I still didn't, I wasn't quite like a hundred percent. It's kind of like, you know, like God. I mean, I, I, I'll go to church every now and then with my wife, but I'm not religious. And I don't think God exists. I'll just do it as like a hedge against, you know, uh, I'm completely wrong on this one. So I just, I just ask myself every now and then, you know, like, how do we like prove without a shadow of doubt? I mean, if you look at Satoshi, whatever his Bitcoin, he's one of the top like five or 10. So he's like, you know, doing a great job. I mean, if he is this like hardcore scammer, he's doing a great job of convincing, you know, a lot of people. Um, and he's quite possibly like the best scammer of all time, you know, with like the Rujas, you just literally you watch like 30 seconds of their video and you're like, yeah, these guys are smelly, but it's like, Craig has gone like to the nth degree to, to, to figure this one out. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so that's what he's relying upon is that you can't prove a negative. Like it's not possible mm. to disprove that someone is Satoshi, mm. but what we can prove and what I have in my, like how many wrongs make a right article on Bitcoin magazine mm. is proving dozens of lies that and contradictions that he's been caught in over the years, including, uh, you know, technical misunderstandings of Bitcoin that Satoshi she never would have made in the first place. Um, and, you know, also a very long list of lies, like about his academic credentials. And uh, he also has a very lengthy legal history where he has been accused of fraud, you know, not once, but on numerous occasions. Cool. Okay. So I don't want to take up more of your time. I, don't, I know you probably have something else to do, uh, but Jameson, I just want to say, Thanks again for, you know, this time, really enjoyed it, really admire the fact that you're like, it seems like one of a few hardcore Bitcoiners, I really respect that. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. I mean, if, if you want to just end off on like, uh, where people can, you know, find you on Twitter, um, you know, your, your, your Casa's website as well, just so that, yeah, it's easier for people to get there. Yep. Uh... My Twitter handle is just LOPP, L-O-P-P, and you can learn all about CASA and our offerings at keys.casa, keys.casa. Awesome. All right, buddy. I guess we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Just give me one second. Thanks.